My name is Ivy Thade. I am the Vice President and Director of Education here for the Costume Designers Guild. We're super pleased to have this panel of many masterclasses we plan to have this year. I'd like to thank the Beverly Center and Brooks Brothers for sponsoring this event. And I'd also like to thank the hardworking team at the Costume Designers Guild, Brigitte Romanoff, Kristen Ingram, Anna Wyckoff, and the office for helping me get this panel off the ground tonight. And without further ado, please give a warm welcome for our moderator, Deadline Senior Editor, Dominic Patton. Patton. Thank you for joining us for the power of the suit, designing the silhouette. We have some amazing costume designers here. I know that we have many members of the guild in the audience, don't we? Will you please raise your hands if you're a member of the Costume Designers Guild? All right. Do not be intimidating. <laughs> um, we're going to have a little chat, and then we hope that you guys will have some questions. When we come to you guys to ask questions, please raise your hand and tell who your question is for. And please don't say for everyone on the panel, because there's a lot of people here. And without further ado, allow me to introduce them. I want to start off talking about something. Ellen and Rudy have a very interesting, for lack of a better expression, origin story. So who gave who their first job? I gave Rudy his first, well, I don't know if it was his first job, but his first job as a cost assistant costume designer, right? Yep, yeah. I it, Rudy worked for me on The Nick, and in the first season- A great show. Great show, it was a great show. Um, and the first season, he he was the costumer in the truck. And he pulled the clothes every single um, day for everything that we did. And the next season, he really wanted to become a designer. And so we were very fortunate. We had a conversation, got him into the guild and, well, no, the union, right? Yep. 829. And he began to uh, fit and do all the background. Yep. And that was his first job. And, and so Rudy... And look at him now. Look at him now. I know, American fiction. Rudy, you know, that story, I love that story about the two of you, and I love that idea. Um, what was that like for you working with Ellen, and what did you learn from Ellen that you brought forward in your career, which, as I mentioned, has done many, many, many things, and, of course, now with Jeffrey Wright in American fiction? Do as best as you can, despite whether you have a lot of money or not. <laughs> Yeah, uh, yeah. Uh, be kind. You're only ever as good as your crew. So hire, the, as Ellen says, hire the best and do the best you can. And uh, yeah, have fun. Now, of course, we should mention that you are nominated this year for the Costume Designer Guild Award for American Fiction. Yep. As is Ellen, as is Mark. <laughs> um, Sophie... You also were nominated this year for season three of The Morning Show. This year on The Morning Show, obviously, we saw some new characters. We saw John Hamm. We saw some real changes in the way the show worked. But we also got a sense of the characters in the show. And specifically, I want to talk about Reese's character because there was a maturation that we saw with her. You've worked with Reese on a number of projects. What is that collaboration like with her in trying to finding that character and kind of honing that character as the show moves on. We have a really long relationship because we met on Legally Blonde. So over the years, we've created many characters together. So there's a shorthand because of that. And then, and part of that is also, I know what she's worn and what she hasn't worn and, and what the characters have looked like over the years. So we can take that out of the way when you start creating something new. But Bradley's character, she, more than I think any of the other characters, changed over the three seasons. She started as a field reporter, moved into evening news, and then in season three has more, moved into the anchor chair. So It's a slicker, more refined look. It's a slicker, more refined look. And she, as a character, is not particularly interested in fashion and clothing. Yeah. So she started off very basic and has had to move into the gravitas of her work situation. So that's basically what we've been doing across the seasons is just moving that arc forward. When you do that in a show, obviously there, there is a parallel because many people who are now anchors on, on network shows started out doing stuff like that. What do you use as, as sort of your narrative or your inspiration for that to find th the look that works? I mean, I, as all of us do, we start with the character on the page yeah. and then you use, or I use, part imagination, part research, part what I see people wearing in everyday life and, you know, 
comparisons with other people in that job. And then it's just all of those things come together, you know, ultimately in the fitting room along with direction from the showrunners and the directors and the actors themselves. And then it, it just happens in the fitting room for me anyway. Michelle, you are nine-time Emmy-nominated Michelle Gold. <laughs> yeah. I wanted to jump to you on this because to pick up sort of what Sophie said. So uh, you worked on Blackish for a number mm -hmm. of seasons and now you're on Gronish, yeah. which is moving towards its, its conclusion. Um, and in a sense, there's also that evolution because you went from the one the family show to the college show. Mm -hmm. What was that jump like for you and how? what were the challenges that came with doing that? Well, Besides we, the fact you were working with teenagers. Stanley, my ACD is here. And when we started, Yara was 17. Look at her now and you can see a huge difference. And we're getting ready. We have three shows left, which is kind of bittersweet. And she's grown. She's 24. She's out of Harvard. And her clothes have changed, you know, from being sweatsuits to things like that when we first started. And we had an ensemble of 11 actors to dress with 10 to 12 changes a show. And I do a sitcom, which is 22 minutes. So that's a lot of changing in one show. And because um, Kenya Barris, our executive producer, he loves clothes. And, <laughs> and so, but it's been, a, it's been a challenge. You learn a lot from these kids, a lot. And uh, we had Luca, we have a lot of uh, actors who were Chloe, who's with Beyonce, Hallie, who's with Beyonce. They know fashion. So you really do learn a lot about the street, what's really cool on the streets. And they taught me a lot about a lot about that because this is not street. And so, <laughs> but uh, we've had a great well, time. The streets were day or dry. Yeah, yes. But um, but we've had a great time on that show. We've had a um, it's 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 sad that it's coming to an end, but the ish is coming to a final end. So it's um, it is what it is. But there you have it. Yeah. It's a pretty damn good end. It it, it is kind of a two time end for you because with Blackish. Pardon me. Kind of two times because you saw Blackish. Yeah. Today and then now this. I, and we did the pilot for Mixish, and we did the pilot for Blackish, and we did the pilot for Gronish. So I'm really really proud of my team. I'm really proud of all of us that we worked. I mean, it's it's brutal. We did two shows a week, so it's a a lot to do in one week. Now, when you, mm -hmm. with that, did did your team pretty much stay consistent with you through the run? Yes. It's the three runs, I guess. Some of them quit. So, <laughs> and, and uh, but they do come they do come back so <laughs> um but we've had a good time we've had a good time but it is a very fast paced show you get a script on monday the rack goes to the trailer on friday you shoot on monday so it is very it's a brutal it's a brutal schedule but we did but we do it so i'm really proud mm. mark Mark, of course, is a two-time Oscar winner. Mark, of course, we won an Oscar for The Artist. Mark has worked on films like The Joker. And this year, of course, your work on Maestro. Now, Maestro, part of what makes the film work so well, in my opinion, is it's very much of a time and place. And part of that is definitely the costumes. It puts you where you are with that, with the Bernsteins and, and with that world of New York at that time. How did you access that i mean people would say because a lot of people say well he just looked at some pictures of leonard bernstein wearing a suit and figured it out right but how did you find that because these are intimate moments with people close tells the story of who they become who they are yeah so i i did in fact look at pictures of he <laughs> of him wearing a suit yeah and but then you have a script to work with and and apply that research to dramatic moments and how it's going to give emphasis to the the moments in the script and make it sort of beautiful and interesting to look at and and uh tell us where we are yeah. in in a person's lifetime you know i fortunate enough to do 40 years of a person's life from the from the 40s to the late 80s a lot of changes socially palettes changed uh length of skirts shoulders you know and you're using we're using all of that to tell a story and to give signposts of a life well lived. Can Mark, can you tell us a little bit about these suits, the designs, the ideas, and what they, what they represent in terms of the eras? Yeah, the one on the left, the gray uh, Glen plaid, that is really, look at a picture, 
make the suit because it's such a stunning photograph in research of Lenny. Everything about it speaks to who he was in uh, night, like the late 60s. Uh, he's wearing the cool boots. He's got the slim trousers, a single breasted. Uh, but we start to see the 70s creep in with a little wider lapel. And uh, so he was so striking and such a movie star in the photograph of Lenny. And he's with a cigarette and his foot is up. Yeah. I was like, this is perfect. First of all, we see him in that time and it works for my script. Yeah. You know, and then the other one is uh, 1976 or seven. Very different. I found a prototype suit that I fell in love with at Motion Picture, and I hoped it would work on him, but um, we copied all the details. I just love the bellows pockets and the action back and the half belt in the back, and then chose a shirt color that speaks about his lifestyle at the time, but also was very much in style. Of course, you have to play with the width of the neckties to tell you everything where you are in a timeline. And um, yeah, I and hopefully they don't upstage anything in the scenes. They, well, that, that was the question I have because I often find as a, as a viewer when I watch shows and we're not at the we're now in the place in terms of the industry where we make there's a, a lot of shows that take place in the 1970s. And having grown up partially in the 70s, it was not a, it was not a decade that fashion particularly had a lot of love for it's, at certain times. Um, how do you work to make sure that the clothes don't overwhelm? Because I always think that that can be a great risk, especially with identifiable eras like that. You know, we're dealing with characters who shopped on Madison Avenue or Bergdorf Goodman. So I don't think there was a real chance who had taste and, and lived in a certain society. So I don't think there was a real chance of going too far uh, if you stayed with the character and the people we were talking about, yeah. Mark and Ellen are nominated in the same category this year's Costume Designer Awards. We don't have any, un unfortunately, we don't have any of Ellen's costumes here. We have a rather nice drawing, though, of uh, Mr. Murphy at the end. But Ellen, in a si similar sense, you know, Oppenheimer is very much a period piece. Um, what did you utilize to capture that? And what were the surprises you found in doing so? Well, Oppenheimer also takes place over 45 years. It, it, it start, we start in the 20s, however, and it, we go through to the um, early 60s. And the thing about and there was a massive, massive amount of research that was available to us, massive black and white photos that lined a house, truthfully. And the the idea of this telling the story of this um, man who lived to change the world was a, a huge task. It was a huge task. And, and why I say that is that he was a man that was had such great complexity and complication in his, in his being. And also the text of our script was very clear about what was really going to be necessary the script indicated it was from his point of view. So it was a little bit of a twist on how you tell the story. Um, Oppenheimer was brought up in a privileged, um, a privileged place. His father actually was a man who imported fabric from Europe at that time and had, he had great resources. He, so Oppenheimer was always exposed to the finest things in life, the finest of luggage, fabric, places to live, um, was not really um, without anything. But what he was, was a very fragile soul. He was very complex. He was very chaotic. He was a genius. He was fragile. And uh, the fragility would like really, really kind of uh, just kind of support what we had to do to design the costumes for him. That that actually indicated what his suitings would look like. His style, the, the shape and the silhouette of his style did not change from the 20s to the 60s. However, it always looked different, and there was a different drape to it depending on his, um, his weight 
and his fragility of his soul. But he knew from a very, very, very early age on that he could be like, he actually conceived this himself. He wanted, this was not by accident that he actually presented in the way that he presents. Everything was very carefully calculated and chosen. When he puts the hat on and picks up the pipe, it was all calculated. He knew what he, what he needed to do to present himself, aside from being a ladies' man. I mean, he just, he, ladies loved him. He just, was just absolutely gorgeous to them. And it, what was fascinating about it is that you had to make choices in design, not look purposeful, but be purposeful at the same time. Yeah. Mark, American fiction is not a period piece, but in a sense, it is a period piece in a sense. And you have, you have done, because it captures a time and place in America. Um, you have also done things like The Alienist, which very much showed a particular type of American silhouette. How working on a show like that, how does that help to inform you when it comes to working on something like American fiction? Hard question. Uh, I, I guess the bottom line is, and especially with, with this film, but kind of overall, unless it's a, a fantasy film, you, or at least I always try and approach design with having things be rooted in reality. Um, and so... Cord and I, who uh, Cord Jefferson, who wrote and directed the film, we've been friends for close to 20 years. Um, I started out uh, as a junior editor at Vogue, and I think he was he was like a political commentator, I think, for CNN at the time. Um, and so we both got into film uh, separately. And from the very first conversation, he he wanted the the film to to look and feel timeless. So you could watch it 10 years ago today or 10 years from now. And, you know, it's almost like the the clothes are secondary. So it was less about making them costumes and more about just being rooted in reality. Um, and like I said, you know, like Ellen taught me, you you do as, as best you can with little money. I mean, we had no money. I think my budget for the whole movie was 30 grand all in, which, uh, you know, 30 grand is a lot of money, but not when you have, you know, 60, 60 characters to dress. Um, so it's like, you know, like that blue suit you see over there, like that's like 60 bucks from Zara on the clearance rack. But, it, you know, you put it on Adam Brody and he's, you know, all of a sudden. That, I don't think that outfit that Issa was wearing cost <laughs> 60 bucks. Uh, no, uh, $20. Yeah. From, I mean, God bless Issa Ray, but uh, yeah. <laughs> uh, uh, it was 1999. Uh, me and my assistant Tyler found it uh, across the street at the mall. And I... Tyler, stand up. Stand up, Tyler. There he is. <laughs> Tyler Kinney. Yeah, it, it was literally $20. And I think the, the brand was called Mall, like Mall Brats with a Z. <laughs> but it's like, you know, but then she also went into like a $2,000, like, you know, Aquazar. It's like you, yeah. you find the high and the low and then you hope that, you know, you figure it out. But I think we went over, Tyler, we went over like $700, I think, in the end, which is like... Yeah, it, it doesn't always happen, but yeah. So now that's like you know, obviously you've done you've done a number of projects with Ryan Murphy. You did Dahmer. Um, you working on um, uh, Feud, the new one, uh, the Truman Capote one, um, uh, with Lou Eirich. Yeah. How how coming off of something like American Fiction did or did not change the way that you did things, or maybe give you different a different insight into them? Maybe because of things like budgetary constraints and others. Well, it, it all depends on, you know, the story you're telling and what what the script requires. But I mean, the, it was me, Tyler, and I think we had three or four other people. So like Tyler and I, we were the PA, we were the shopper, we were the... So obviously with someone like, you know, with Ryan and also with Feud, you're, we went from, I think, the 20s up through the 80s when Capote died. So it's, you know, we had a significantly bigger budget and... uh yeah, M more than six of us doing it. So, but but at the end of the day, you know, you you do the best you can, and yeah, and do so, good work. You know, you you have specialized over your career in comedy, and and you started out with In Living Color, one of the great television shows of all time. Yeah. Um, I'm always interested in that in in a show like that because you've got 
I guess if, when I remember it, there would be at least six, if not seven skits throughout the show, then a musical number, which I don't know how much you guys were involved with that. But how did like that, the amount of inventory, like how does that work? It was a lot of inventory. Keenan Ivory Wayne, he would do about 30, ep 30 sketches a week. And we had to prep them as though they were going to happen. And then we would, his thing was if he had to rewrite it and rewrite it, then we would exit. So we would get down to like six or seven sketches at the end. And then we had the fly girls that did their four dance breaks. So it was nonstop. I didn't see Neiman Marcus or Barney's for five years. And so, <laughs> and so uh, we shopped at, and how I met Sal Perez right there. Um, he would pull clothes for me at um, Aardvark. Aardvark on Melrose when I was doing In Living Color and traffic was no problem on Hollywood Boulevard. Wow. So, yeah, you remember, do you remember that? And um, Ellen just totally sparked up with that. <laughs> traffic, no problem on Hollywood Boulevard? So Ellen's was, from the Bronx. She doesn't take, yeah. that, shit. She takes that stuff seriously. So it was a lot of work. I learned a lot. I was, I, it was my first show. Um, my team and I got nominated our first for our first year ever. Wow. So yeah, it was, it was, in, it was an incredible experience. I never forget. Rhett Turner called me and said, "I'm so proud of you" because I used to do set for him. Wow. Yeah, so um, I had to put Bob Hope socks on him when he did the Oscars. <laughs> but um, it was a, a great experience. I learned so much, and I'm so proud of that show, and I'm so proud of my team because a lot of them are all costume designers now. So I'm really happy for them, and um, but. It's, I can't believe, I don't even know how I came up with half the sketches that I did. Yeah, yeah I don't. And um, I go back and I'm going, you're so good. Look at you, girl. <laughs> you were good. <laughs> I was younger. You asked me to do, you asked me to do a variety show now. I'm like, uh-uh, no way. But, um, but it was a great experience. I came, I did, um, I know Sonia, when we, uh, Sophie, when we did uh, commercials together, did the Nike campaigns, worked for a lot of big houses, Sandy Crawford, all of those big shows back in the day, all the big commercials, and um, Whitney Houston. And that gave me the chapter to go into the next one. So I always believe that every chapter you do takes you to the next chapter. So if when you think that you're stuck right now, you're not. You're, you're going to keep going. And, you know, so it is, um, it was an experience. And then when I did commercials, I did In Living Color. And then from there, that took me on to do Bernie Mac and other great shows. So I'm really, the whole, I, I was not a comedy. I wanted to be a costume designer that did Broadway. So, wow. so, <laughs> so, I, so I don't know how I got into comedy. I'm not funny. And um, <laughs> I would disagree on that. <laughs> but it is, it was a lot of fun. And I encourage, I love television with all of my heart. I, my, my hat goes off to these, these costume designers that do features. I don't know how they do it. And I'm really like in all of you that you're sitting next to me. So I'm in all of that. But uh, but I love television. It's it's my format. I don't want to do anything else. And so I, I love it. So thank you. Mm -hmm. Sophie, uh, Michelle mentioned you guys working early together. And of course, you, you worked at commercials. You've done music videos and what have you. But you're now working with uh, the design house Lafayette 148, correct? Correct. Yeah. Um, and and give us a little bit of an explanation. And if you could also tell us a little bit about there's some amazing clothes over here of yours. Uh, how how did that collaboration come together? And what has been some of the results? It was it just came together completely organically on the third season. We always had an issue with Reese when she needed suits for the show because we're not a made to order show. We don't build. We shop. We source. We find. And you know she's very little. And we were coming out of this oversized suiting moment on the first season. And it was always a struggle to find what we needed in time when we got the scripts and we were like, shit, we need 10 more suits now. And then Reese's stylist, Petra Flannery, was like, oh, you should meet these guys at Lafayette. So I was like, okay, cool. And we went for breakfast. And, and it was just because it was just one of those things that just worked really well for everybody. So it was on an organic meet. And then we were at that point in the show where Reese's character, she's now the evening news anchor. So we needed to elevate her. And so we were able to work with them for them to custom build us the suits that we needed for her in our palette. And are those those suits? Yeah, one of them's actually yes. Stella's. The lavender one was one that was off the rack that was for Stella, who's, you know, one of our favorite characters on yes. the show to dress. 
And then the the burgundy suit that was that was a custom build for Bradley for Reese's character. Now, in terms of that, because you say that in pre in seasons one and two, you guys you did a lot of buying. Did how did that change things for you as a as a costume designer? Did it refocus you, or did it free you up? Or well, I'm I'm always interested in the day to day workflow. You know, with contemporary shows, at least you know, on our show or with us, like we are a shopping show. That is what we do. And we're working with contemporary characters in the moment and we need a large amount of volume. And it is about finding, and that's part of, you know, I came from styling, I came from music videos and commercials and had always worked in this contemporary way. And I don't have a period background. I've done period commercials and, you know, et cetera, et cetera. So, and that's what works for this show with the pace that you have with television and what you need and you don't know what's coming up. So you just, you constantly you know, feeding the rat, feeding the rat. And so, but when I was doing back in the day, you know, what I loved about do, and doing the music videos was the, the resources that you had to work with the fashion houses. Like this, you know, that was something that kind of, and on Le- Legally Blonde, that was something I brought with me to Legally Legally Blonde. And then it's kind of over the years, it's just become part of my work, but you don't get the opportunity to collaborate in the same way with the fashion houses, because it just doesn't work anymore and you don't need to do it. You can find or you can build what you need at a certain point. So it was it was great to be able to go back in that world. And, you know, on the show, I collaborate with my assistant designer, who's also now our lead designer, Beth Lancaster, you know. So you have a collaborative process with the people that you work with and your team and the producers and the directors and the actors, but it was really nice to go back and work with the fashion house and collaborate with them to see how that side of the world is working, you know, and what's coming to market and all of, all of that stuff. Mark, one of the things that's always intrigued me is, is, is on the artist. I always kind of wanted to get a sense, you know, when you look at, and we talk about the costumes you have for Maestro here, and especially that one from the Bicentennial, color is so much a part of it. Not so much with the artist, not much color, no color, in fact. So how does that change what you do or does it? It's interesting with the artist. uh, It was a completely originally uh, an independent film. Someone wrote a check for $10 million that we were going to make that movie from $10 million. And they wanted to make sure that it could play in any of the markets around the world. And supposedly like Southeast Asia won't accept black and white films. So I had to keep in mind that it needed to play well in color as well. But I found out pretty quickly that contrast and texture and sparkly uh, sequins and things really read well in the black and white and could play either in color or black and white. So it became more emphasizing contrast and textures. And I carried that over to the maestro and... This time, though, in Maestro, we committed to black and white film. Yeah. I think the artist was digital desaturation, but uh, we used black and white film on this film. Yeah. So it, we did do tests, but basically the same things um, held true. But you're, if you see one of the dresses, there's a the first time we see Carrie, she has a gray dress and she has a shawl. Well... That they're actually two different fabrics, oh. but they look the same in black and white. So it's that middle value where in color they all look very different, but when you turn them black and white, a whole medium value looks exactly the same. Yeah. So I had this extra fabric that was, it read the same. So when you see the real costume in person, there's it's a different color, but it reads perfectly well in black and white. We're going to, we want to do some questions from you guys soon, but I have to ask you guys, all of you, I'm going to start with you, Mark, because you're here. You get to be subject number one. What is your favorite thing you've ever designed and what movie is it from? Um, You know, very early on uh, in Boogie Nights, there is a three-piece brush denim tuxedo that uh, Dominic made. The Canadian tuxedo. Well, it's no... It's it's a tuxedo for with satin lapels and a satin stripe, but it's made out of blue brush denim. And I made it for Dirk's first adult film award. 
and uh, it and the covered satin buttons on the waistcoat, and it was a triumph. And it is lost for the ages. Oh, no, really? no one knows where that. I bet if you go right to Marky now. Mark's closet, you're going to no, find that one. I, I keep thinking I'm going to see it at Hard Rock Cafe or so, oh, or online. Yes. Something. It, it was there was a moment in fashion where denim was exalted. Yeah. I would see like denim double-breasted business wear in the 1977 GQ, yeah. and uh, I had to do something like that. So the brush denim three-piece tugs. Wow. Yeah. Wow. Sophie. <laughs> I'm going to say it's the pink Jackie O suit from Legally Blonde 2. But the, but the reason is when we did the camera test and, you know, there were many, many costumes in that movie that I'm very fond of and, and the original Legally Blonde. But we were doing the camera test and Reese is in her suit and she's ready to go. And she's, and she's like, I don't know about the hat. I just don't know about the hat. I just think it's too much. And I was like, just put the hat on. And so she goes in front of the camera. And we put the hat on her and then we were like, oh my God, there she is. And it was just that magical moment when every single thing oh. came together, like in the camera, in the monitor, and you were just like, and that's, that's what we're doing. That's our girl. And that, that's why it's my, my favorite. Um, oh boy, mine, I have so many, like the rest of you guys, right? Um, mine would be Homie the Clown. <laughs> <laughs> my wow you went way back to pull that one <laughs> the my would be homie the clown i don't know if anybody remembers ted shell yes. oh, he built it for me so yeah so um and of course the fly girls everything they wore so i'm i doubled i doubled my. i have a question because of what mark said and sophie if you don't mind i'm jumping back to you where is that outfit now there are two of them. Yeah. One of them lives with Reese, and one of them lives with a collector. Mm. Ah. Uh -huh, because she very early on, like after the first Legally Blonde, was I'm archiving all of my costumes. She had it written into her contract. So she, the, a lot of the ones from the first one are gone, but from the second on, they're, they're, they're pretty much in her storage wherever that is. Okay, so Michelle, no, Michelle, no, we already know from her. So where's Homie? I don't know. I don't know where Homie is. <laughs> I don't know. I'm, I'm going to give it over. We're going to sit. You might see a deadline article about where's homie. Oh, where's, yeah, where's homie? <laughs> well, no, it's just, you know, honestly, because I will say, like, some of the outfits all of you have created, are iconic. Yeah. 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 Ye
I, one question I have about Basic Instinct is is the, you mentioned it about the great the contrast between what Sharon's yeah. wearing in the room and the way Paul did that. Were you involved in those discussions? Did he say to you, I need something that pops against the wall? No, he didn't say that. But what he said, what we did is we went thir- we went thoroughly through the design of the room and what that monochromatic look was going to be and the contrast of this Hitchcockian blonde. OK, so that in herself, even naked, she had that persona. And so he would say, well, what do you, he would like literally just like say, so what are you going to do? What are you going to do? What are you going to give me? And if that how for you as a designer, is that liberating or is that intimidating? It's never intimidating. Wow. It's never or so from the Bronx. <laughs> so from the Bronx. No, it's never. Intimidating. I grew up in Hell's Kitchen and we were afraid of people like you. <laughs> oh, no, you weren't. No, you weren't. But, you know, it, it's never intimidating because. The only I would use the word it could be challenging, but it's never intimidating. And it's what are you going to do? What are you going to do? And then all of a sudden something comes to you and you. All right, I'll show you in a minute. And then then it comes and so on. We made that dress. We made six of them because it had to work in in a rain scene as well. And no one knew the thing about all of these iconic costumes, which is quite. I always find fascinating is that when we design these costumes, we don't know they're going to become iconic. We don't know that it's going to like set a trend. We don't know what is going to happen. We are really just designing and actually filling the character in a way that the material has presented. You know, you know, honestly, at, at, you didn't feel that with Bridgerton? You didn't think, no, oh, this no, is going to light no, it up? No, 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 not at all. Not at all. Not at all. We knew we were doing something that was going to... The, the brief was, okay, yes, it takes place in, um, in, the, in Regency England, but Shonda only likes, really, she likes a fashion spin on it. Okay, so we know that she likes, and she likes to kind of have some kind of influence or affluence associated with it all. Those are just adjectives, right? So what what I did first and foremost was I put a book together, and I put a book together of um, merging different styles together, just as a whole entire, not only palette, but a world in which we were about to create. I presented it because I don't think I could have started because they said in the beginning, they said, no bonnets, no bonnets. And um, they weren't necessarily that interested in time, but the essence of time was important. And so looking at the book, everything was, everything was very clear about the world that we were about to create. And they were in 100%, 100%. And then everybody else got on board, and they had to be in 100%. So we were really fortunate that we were able to create the world first as costume designers and what that whole world was going to be. And quite seriously, on my kid who's here tonight, her life, we didn't have a clue. We, I thought I'd get, uh-oh, here's going to be... She didn't do anything right. She didn't do anything right. It's not period. But I think at the at the end of the day, I really didn't really feel that we were going to be um, successful. We really didn't feel it. Everybody felt like, wow, I get to explore this world in a different way, in a different manner. It was liberating for the actors, quite liberating, because they didn't get stuck in a Jane Austen type world, because everything was so vibrant and fresh and new and so on. But that being said, I remember the junket happened and, a, and a, a reporter journalist called and said, wow, this is like amazing. And we said, what, really? Because we hadn't seen anything. Yeah. And it was really quite a surprise. And then the result of that, of course, was huge. And that was as big a surprise as you could get. Rudy, for you. I haven't done anything quite as iconic as, you know, my friends up here, but I, I would say 
Unless but you're on your way. Uh, whoa, whoa. whoa. <laughs> I, I, would, I would stop for a sec. Uh, spoiler alert. A, you did the Jeffrey Dahmer thing. And let's be, I mean, I, it, it's a different, I would say different, but no, le no less uh, striking. I would also say you've got this thing with Truman Capote coming out and sure. literally there's a black and white ball that literally was one of the defining uh, events of the decade of the 1960s. Yeah, yeah. I, I guess uh, my favorite thing that I've done was, uh, I mean, anytime you get to, you know, dive into Victorian era or anything, you know, 200 or so years ago um, is always fun. But we filmed The Alienist in uh, Budapest, Hungary, and um, I think I had about 12, uh, 12 cutters, uh, you know, within the workroom, and uh, none of them spoke English. So, you know, it was a lot of sign language, and, and actually, Gabor, who I met through Ellen on the Nick, uh, is one of the most incredible tailors on the planet. Um, you can literally send him a photo of the actor with measurements and within a centimeter the actor will slip it on and it's good to go um and he speaks no english uh and only does period tailoring and uh wait tell him how fast he does it i, I would like it in a day uh, uh, i mean so if you if you if you email two hours, if you email, email the soup. photo today you get a suit by tuesday yeah taking the holiday into account yes no yeah. holiday you get a holiday yeah <laughs> Yeah. It's a federal one. Well, and he also works in a tiny basement where only half the door opens, so you have to slide in. Oh, yeah. I have to and tell the, you, like, why <laughs> haven't you guys made a documentary? Like, literally. <laughs> so, so some of those are the most incredible, just because you know it, it's really crazy what what you can accomplish with sign language and you know the three Hungarian words that I do. Uh, you know, it's you did pretty well. Uh, thanks. Uh, were the three Hungarian words? This is good. <laughs> Kitchen. We're going to take some questions from you guys, but just before we take some questions, I have a very quick thing, but I think it's pertinent to talk about. Um, you know, one of the issues the Costume Designer Guild is looking at is pay equity. You know, there are, yes. Because nothing says I love you like cold hard cash. And no, but that's true. And, you know, and department heads in the way the, way the industry has been structured and such, costume designers in, in, for the most part, have often come home with a lighter load than others. And that. I wanted to get a sense from all of you, just quickly, if you don't mind, what's your feeling about where this is going to go and, and where do you hope to see it go? Mark? You know, I look at the films and the things that we do and I see how much of the frame is costume and I see how much it informs the piece. And uh, I think some adjustments need to be made in the industry to and proportionate to how much we fill that frame and tell that story. I mean, I think for me, my approach has always, I, you know, it, the thing with our rates, I think over the years, like we share a lot more information than we used to. And it's, it's, it's you have to, I always had to be very careful not to get competitive and be like, what's everybody else getting? What am I getting? And this, that, and the other. And so I narrowed my focus to what is the production designer making? And that was, and that has, that is where I stand now is that for me, it's, it's about getting equity with the production designer. I consider them my peers. We bring the same thing to the process in many ways. And that is, and that, that is what I have to say about it. It's not what anybody else makes, it's not what any other costume designers makes. It's what does the production designer make? And I want that. So I agree with Mark. Um, I just recently, this past week um, on my show, had to fight for my assistance. Um, they had a photo shoot and they didn't want to pay them. And um, that's another thing that we have to work on is is making sure because everybody wanted to, to add hours to our paychecks. And I said, no, we're not going to add hours to our paycheck. We're going to get a day rate for each. Each person is going to get a day rate. So we still haven't heard the answer. But... <laughs> But we're, but that's, I agree with him as far as we have to get better at this. We really do. And we have to share information. I know none of us want to tell each other how much we get paid. But a lot of times when I'm working at ABC and ABC's a little bit on the cheap side, I'll, I'll call different designers and I'll ask them like, well, how are you doing this? How are we doing this? So we can kind of band together to do this. So it's going to take a village and a little bit longer time, like you said, to, to really to do this and we really, really got to work hard on this. Each and every one of us, I agree. I mean, I, I believe, yeah. 
Yes. By the way, I didn't mean to imply don't share information. I meant do share the information. Yes, we do. You do need to share. I agree both with Mark and I agree with everybody. I think that I think that the the equity and the parity with the production designer is essential. No matter what size. Now, I mean, if you're working on, let's just say, a $5 million something or other, or a TV show, or a streaming show, I don't care what where the platform is. And so the production designer will normally get, diff there are different rates, and everybody's entitled to work at whatever rate they want to. I think it needs to be parity, without a question of a doubt. And I do think that we always have to fight for our team yeah. because the team is just kicked to the curb yeah. and there's no one to really defend it. And um, I don't think that that is, I, I think that it's disgusting. I really, really think it's disgusting. And I think that the, the disrespect, I think, at, just generally speaking in the whole category to say, well, we could cut some money there. We could cut some money there is really, really not fair. It's like we're all in it. As Marcus so eloquently said, you look at the frame, you see what fills the frame. This is very hard work. It's very demanding work. And it makes a lot of money. And it influences a lot of people, which is, you know, wonderful. But I think we should actually be recognized for that and be paid accordingly and not less than, but. Rudy? Yeah, I, I agree with all of it. I mean, we've all been in a fitting where, you know, it's the first fitting, the actor's there, you know, maybe they've just read the script and there's so many times where the actor, until they put on the clothes, they say, ah, there's the character. And, you know, I, I think we're such an important part of that and their process and yeah pay us what we what we deserve you know very well put my friend does anyone have any questions oh what oh sorry michelle no, no, I was just thinking that, um, can you hear me the mic was hello um is that this past week i just found out one of my assistants wasn't getting paid for her her, her mileage and i that i was like what and then, then i thought i'll pay you you know, so it's see, I mean, see I, since I often the week in the industry, the industry see that, but I actually think that's the sort of thing productions think. They're like, you know what? It's okay because someone's going to step in and be like, well, I'll pay for this for you, right? right. And right. then they're like, and it and all right. those creates, and, and I've written I've written stories about this. Is what then happens is they they're like, well, precedents happened, mm -hmm. and precedent can be a killer because mm -hmm. once you take care of something, someone's like, well, that's on you. Right. You took care of it. Right. You should have right. come to us. You and didn't. So since we've had this strike. Now everybody, you have one less person. I have my BG person is here, and and now they're taking her off the clock. You know, so it's so you're constantly now going back to work, and you're you're fighting where you didn't used to do that, and you know you're getting a little bit more aggravated, and they're seeing the ugly Michelle Cole. Yes. <laughs> this is for Ellen, and I just wanted to say that um, another white dress that you designed uh, on Glenn Cloaks is in one of my favorite costumes. I even wore it in P-Town as a costume one year. Uh, but my question is uh, for fabrics. You had mentioned Oppenheimer's parents were a fabric dealer. For these period fabrics that they don't even make anymore and you're making a period film, where do you source things that just don't get produced anymore? Well, it's, it's difficult to say because a lot of fabric that is that old is rotted. So it's not, I don't necessarily go out and I'm not one that'll say I must have the absolute perfect fabrication. It needs to be exactly like da 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 da. I won't do that. From usually, like for Oppenheimer, we had a short prep. Well, it was like, it was 12 weeks, but it was a short in 12 weeks. We had no money and we really had to cut to the chase quickly. But fortunately, my assistant, Josh, who is here, he comes with quite a, a library of fabric and fabric books. And, and basically, a lot of the fabric that we used come, came from England, and um, it comes from the mills. And it, it, it's a better way in which to use your time and use your money. Because what we found is anything that was that old 
was just filled with so much rot and holes that it basically couldn't be used. Anything that was mm, 30, 40 years, maybe. We had a manufacturer in New York that had a stock of fabric, and we were lucky to use some of that. But it had to be carefully looked at. We couldn't just we couldn't just like automatically say, okay, that's five suits or what have you. We had to really, really carefully. You know, there's always that push and pull. Like you want the authenticity of, of what have you, but there's just realities you come up against, yeah. obviously, on all of these. How do you gauge, and maybe this is just a stupid question for me and you guys all know the answer, but how do you gauge is like, okay, this is how close it is to what it would have been, say something Oppenheimer would have worn in 1942, but this is the modern fabrics I'm working with because I need it to look like this on camera. Obviously, the word right. drape is the one that comes to mind yeah. about that. How, how do you find that balance, Mark? It's it's not easy. Uh, you know, there's a, a famous dress kind of, uh, not necessarily famous, but seen everywhere in Maestro, this ice blue dress that Carrie wears. We see the back of her on the poster. And um, it was copied from a dress from the collection at Western, but we knew white was not going to work. So we sent the swatchers out and we found something that does what that original right. fabric did be sculptural and have a luminescent quality to it. You just have to adapt to yeah. make yeah. it work make for it today. And I, I'm sure you had the problem with the menswear woolens. It's always a problem with the, the weights now are yeah. too light unless you really unless take it, it to but, England. And Engl well, that's what we did. That's what we did. It, it, they're English fabrics. And the, those fabrics have a weight. Well, you can get any weight. You know, I mean, it, it, what, it's, it's kind of going to a candy store, to be honest with you. Um, and being able to find the type of, you know, I, I think that overall, when you, when you begin to design, you know, basically, the film that you want, that you're going to design, and what you are trying to achieve to achieve visually. And you, I think... You just learn what will work on how it's going to be shot, what will work on film, how to test it. What we did when we tested fabrics for black and white, we just looked at the iPhone black and white filter because everything in our film that had to be shot in black and white had to be shot immediately in color. So we could not change. So it, if it worked in a grayscale then we, and we were happy what it looked like in color, that's what it would be move on and but the fabrications itself yeah it is a it twists your brain for sure at the beginning but then slowly but surely you get to really um you know that little angel comes and says no whispers in your ear and you make a choice to move forward and then things fall into place so you know where to look or how to how to achieve what you want it to look like as an end result. And in tailoring, specifically in menswear, you have the ability to be able to understand that construction and understand what you're going to get and, and how you can achieve it just because you have a master tailor that you I don't know how to do it, but you have a master tailor working with you that will help you or work, rework things with you if you have made the wrong choice in fabrication. Other questions? Hi, my name is Natalie. I have a question for Ellen. Um, in Oppenheimer, you had a huge cast, all playing real people. Was there a specific moment and a specific costume that you made maybe for Emily or for Killian that it wasn't quite hitting it and then you changed one thing or did something different and then bam, that's now that person. I see it. It works. Uh, no. Uh, um, no, you know why? We didn't have any time. We didn't have any time. We didn't have any money. So it was like a, sh it was a race to the finish, you know? Um, but the fitting, the fitting process was really, really very, very extensive. And in that fitting process, not only was the way Chris Nolan works is that he's there. And that collaboration is like no other that I've ever experienced with. Um, you know, normally I would be shy to have a, or not really wanting to have an, a director with me 
from the first moment on. That was like kind of, oh, I got to get used to that. But the, the reality of that is, is that the collaboration, the verbiage of the collaboration, the idea you can see how people think and so on and so forth and be attentive on a 360 was really very easy then, right? So he had the patience to stay with us through each and every fitting, every single costume, and we knew when it didn't work. We knew when it didn't work, and we went on to the next. When I work, I don't really get married to anything until it's right. So I don't think that there's anything that um, in changing one thing, it would just be take that off and put something else on <laughs> to make it right. It, that would be the size of it. But um, no, everything had to be very, very clear from the get-go and and it went on film just very soon thereafter. Guys, we really want to thank all of you for coming to join us today. Please give a round of applause for our incredible panel. <laughs>